Well, I'd like to, uh, in these two talks, I'd like to talk about some foundational issues, uh, in particular with the, the most important ones, uh, I think, namely, what are the fundamental uh, computational operations that uh, enter into constructing syntactic objects and uh, why these and not other ones. It turns out there's quite a lot to say about that since uh, the last time I talked here, many problems, some solutions. I'll get to this in the course of the discussion as far as I can. Uh, but I think it would be uh, useful to begin with a couple of comments on something more general, uh, namely, uh, what are we trying to achieve uh, altogether in studying language? Many different ways of looking at it. Uh, these questions, I think, are in many ways more important than the particular technical results. They raise many questions about what is uh, an authentic, uh, genuine explanation, a genuine solution, and what is a maybe very valuable uh, reorganization of data, posing of problems, uh, often uh, posing a solution, but uh, not really achieving it. These things are worth thinking through, I think. Uh, the basic issues were formulated, I think, for the first time, uh, quite perceptively, uh, at the outset of the uh, scientific revolution in the 17th century. Uh, Galileo and his uh, contemporaries, who were raising all sorts of questions about uh, received wisdom, uh, turned their attention to language as well. And they expressed their uh, awe and amazement at the miraculous fact that uh, with a couple of dozen sounds, it was somehow possible to express uh, an infinite number of thoughts and to uh, find ways to convey to others who have no access to our minds uh, everything that's going on in our minds. So in their own words, which I rather like, uh, I'll quote, they were awed by the method by which we, were able, we are able to express our thoughts, the marvelous invention by which using 25 or 30 sounds we can create the infinite variety of expressions which having nothing themselves in common with what is passing in our minds, nonetheless permit us to express all our secrets and allow us to understand what is not present to consciousness. In fact, everything we can conceive and the most diverse movements of our soul. Uh, Galileo himself regarded the alphabet as the most stupendous of human inventions uh, because it had these amazing properties and uh, also because, it, as he put it, uh, it allowed us to express uh, all the wisdom of the ages and to, it contained within it the answers to any questions that we might pose, kind of like a universal Turing machine uh, in our terms. Uh, the, uh, Port Royal Grammar and Logic, uh, actually, which I was just quoting, a paraphrase of Galileo, uh, uh, had uh, many insights into logic and linguistics. It's, in many ways, the basis of modern logic. Uh, there was a rich tradition that developed exploring what was called rational and universal grammar. Uh, rational because it was supposed to provide explanations. Uh, universal because it was concerned with what was taken to be common to uh, the common human possession of language, uh, was seeking explanations, uh, including descriptions of even the vernacular, which was quite uh, surprising at the time, innovative, uh, but mainly uh, explanations and universal trying to find what's common to all languages. Uh, this tradition went on for a couple of centuries, many contributions. Uh, the last representative of it, about a century ago, was uh, Otto Jespersen. As he put it, his concern was how the elements of language come into existence in the mind of a speaker 
on the basis of finite experience, yielding a notion of structure that is definite enough to guide him in framing sentences of his own, a crucially free expressions that are typically new to speaker and hearer, and also beyond that to find the great principles that underlie the grammars of all languages. Now, I think it's fair to interpret, you have to interpret that tradition is metaphoric, often vague, but I think it's fair to extricate from it the recognition that uh, language is uh, the capacity for language uh, as well as individual languages are possessions of individual persons. They're part of a person. Uh, they're shared, it was recognized throughout the species without significant variation uh, and uh, recognized to be unique to humans in fundamental respects. Uh, that general program falls within the natural sciences, uh, within what these days is called the biolinguistic program. Of course, it ran into many difficulties, the conceptual difficulties, empirical difficulties, the evidence was pretty thin, and nobody really understood how to capture the notion, uh, Jesperson's uh, notion of structure in the mind. Uh, what is that that enables us to develop, construct in our minds uh, infinitely many expressions and even to find a way to convey to others what's going on in our mind. That's what we call the Galilean challenge, which is still extant. Well, all of this was swept aside in the 20th century by uh, structuralist, uh, behaviorist uh, currents, which very typically adopted a very different approach to language, uh, taking the object of study not to be something internal to the person, uh, but some outside thing. So uh, maybe uh, a corpus, uh, an infinite set of utterances, uh, some other external formulation. And you see this very clearly if you simply look at the definitions of language that were given through the early 20th century by the leading figures. So for example, for the Saussure, uh, a language is a kind of social contract. It's a collection, as he put, a collection of word images in the uh, uh, community of speakers. Uh, for Leonard Bloomfield, it's uh, languages, uh, uh, the utterances that can be made in a particular speech community. Uh, for Harris, it's uh, the distribution of morphemes in a set of sentences. Uh, uh, for if you move to philosophy of language, uh, say Van Quine, or a uh, language is, as he put it, I'm quoting, uh, a fabric of sentences uh, associated with one another and with stimuli by the mechanism of conditioned response. Uh, elsewhere, uh, an infinite set of sentences. Uh, David Lewis, uh, language and languages, uh, also took just languages, a uh, language is some set of sentences, which is infinite. Uh, both Quine and Lewis crucially argued that it makes sense to talk about an infinite set of sentences, but not of a particular way of generating them, which is a very strange notion if you think about it, because uh, and these are the leading logicians in philosophy. You can't talk about an infinite set in any coherent fashion unless you have some characterization of what's in it and what's not in it. Uh, otherwise, you're not saying anything. Uh, but the behaviorist, uh, uh, the pressure of behaviorist beliefs was so powerful that the idea that there could be a privileged way of generating that infinite set was, as Quine put it, folly. Lewis put it, something unintelligible. Uh, but uh, whatever any of these entities are, they're outside the individual. Uh, the tradition was completely forgotten. Uh, people like Jesperson, the last representative, were literally unknown. Uh, this good review of this by a historian of linguistic, Julia Falk, who runs through the, uh, the way Jesperson was disappeared in the first half of the 20th century uh, and the whole tradition way back uh, also. In fact, to this day, the, uh, even uh, 
linguistic historical scholarship is pretty thin. Uh, it doesn't barely recognizes any of the things I've mentioned. Well, so returning to the forgotten tradition, uh, by the mid 20th century, uh, it was there was there were clear ways of capturing the concept uh, notion of structure in the mind, uh, Jesperson's concept, uh, Turing, other great mathematicians had established the uh, tools for addressing the Galilean challenge, something you're all, I'm sure, familiar with. So Jesperson's notion of structure uh, becomes the, uh, what's now called the I language, the internal generative system, finite system that uh, determines an infinite array of hierarchically structured expressions uh, that express thoughts uh, insofar as they can be expressed linguistically, and it can be externalized in sensory motor systems, uh, typically, though we know, not necessarily sound. Uh, we can call this the basic property of language. Well, to meet the Galilean challenge, uh, there are several uh, tasks that have to be undertaken. The main one, of course, is to try to determine the internal languages, the I languages of speakers of typologically varied languages, a huge task. Then the question is, comes of how a speaker selects a particular expression from the internal I language. Then how the expression, once selected, is externalized. And the inverse, how the externalization is internalized by the hearer. The last two. Uh, tasks are both input-output systems. We kind of grasp how to study those, and quite a lot has been learned about it over the years. Uh, the first of them, uh, how the speaker selects uh, a syntactic object out of the infinite array, that's a total mystery. There's nothing to say about it. Uh, that's true of uh, voluntary behavior generally. So uh, actually here at MIT, some of the Two of the leading uh, specialists on uh, the, the neuroscience of voluntary action, Emilio Bizzi, uh, Robert Ajamian, of about a year ago, wrote a kind of state of the art article in which um, they discussed how what they know about voluntary motion, simple, not, not language, simple things like lifting your finger, you know. And uh, they said, well, they put it as they said fancifully that we're beginning to learn about the uh, puppet and the strings, but we can't say anything at all about the puppeteer. So how you select what you're going to do remains the kind of question that you can't even pose intelligibly in the sciences at this stage here as well. Well, the I language, keeping to the tradition, is a property of the individual, and also the species-specific uh, faculty of language, also an internal property, uh, something which allows the I language to be acquired. And it has to meet a couple of empirical conditions, uh, two conditions which are kind of conflicting, uh, the conditions of learnability and the conditions of evolvability. So whatever the faculty of language is, it's got to be rich enough so that possessing it uh, a child can acquire the I language from the scattered and limited data available, and it is scattered and limited, uh, and uh, it has to and achieve the uh, uh, internal system, which has all of these rich and complex consequences. Uh, so it has to be that rich, but it also has to be simple enough so that it could have evolved. And now we can be a little more specific about that because some of the conditions of uh, evolution of language are coming to light. And uh, I'll talk about it later if there's time. And uh, the evolution has to meet those empirical conditions. Well, those are the conditions for a genuine explanation. Uh, if some uh, proposed uh, descriptive device uh, satisfies these conditions, then it's the basis for an explanation uh, for addressing the 
Galilean challenge as it was formulated and developed in the tradition of uh, rational and universal grammar. Uh, the general explanation is always at the level of UG, the theory of the faculty of language, and it has to offer some prospects of satisfying the conditions of learnability and evolvability. That's a pretty austere requirement, very austere requirement, but it's the right requirement. Anything short of that is short of actually explaining things. It's maybe very valuable, maybe organizing problems in an interesting way, uh, can move on from there, but uh, still falls short of general explanation. Uh, we can now, I think, grasp somewhat more clearly what actually is a genuine, genuine explanation, something that was really not possible in uh, earlier stages of linguistic inquiry. Uh, but uh, uh, again, uh, any device that's introduced to account for something, unless it can meet these joint, these dual conditions, is uh, short of uh, explanation, maybe very valuable. So many examples. Take a concrete example to illustrate about something I'll come back to later if there's time. Uh, interesting paper by Joko Boscovich, who you all know, uh, on the uh, coordinate uh, structure and adjunct island constraints. And what he points out is that each of these constraints uh, poses many problems, many mysteries. Uh, but his paper is an effort to try to reduce the mysteries by uh, reducing both constraints to the same constraint uh, using the device of uh, neo-Davidsonian uh, event semantics, which interprets uh, uh, a junction as a kind of coordination. So you can reduce both of the problems to the same problem uh, coordination. And then we still have the mysteries, but now a simpler problem, one set of mysteries instead of two independent ones, and tries to show that the problems then reduce in this way. Well, that's a step forward. It leaves the mysteries in a better position for productive inquiry, but it's not an explanation. He's quite clear about that. And I think if you look over the field, that virtually every achievement, everyone, is a partial uh, step forward in this respect. There's very few exceptions, uh, just barely coming to light, which I think can count as genuine explanations. They're important in themselves. Uh, and they're also a kind of a sort of a guideline into how we should think about proceeding. And they may also tell us something about just how far it's possible to go. It's not so obvious you can go much beyond what kinds of explanations that are now beginning to come to light. I'll talk about that. Uh, well, uh, uh, this um, actually the, uh, the earliest work in generative grammar tried to meet even more austere conditions. Uh, the uh, was heavily influenced by uh, work of people like Nelson Goodman and uh, W.V. Quine, who were uh, working on what they called uh, constructive nominalism. Uh, no sets, uh, very austere, uh, uh, just you know, mereological concepts of a very limited kind. Uh, that, that was too austere, at least for the present. Couldn't get very far that way. There were several papers about it. Uh, so that was kind of dropped, at least for the present. Maybe you can come back to it someday. And the tension turned to something else, namely the uh, vast uh, range of empirical data from all kinds of languages that was beginning to appear as soon as the first efforts were made to write actual uh, generative grammars. It turned out that everything was puzzling and complex. And nothing was understood. It was a mass of puzzles. Big change from uh, a few years earlier during the period of structural linguistics, it was basically assumed that everything was known. Uh, everything was solved. We had the methods of analysis. Uh, you could formalize them. Uh, all, all that was needed was to just apply them to one or another language. Uh, that 
turned out to be radically false. Well, the first proposals, as you all know, were dual. They, uh, they were, uh, uh, the, uh, there were operations to deal with the problem of uh, compositionality, uh, very structured grammar, and totally different operations to deal with the phenomenon of dislocation, ubiquitous phenomenon, uh, transformational grammar. Uh, both systems were far too complex uh, to uh, meet the long-term goals of genuine explanation. That was well understood. Uh, the general assumption at the time remaining for a long time, often up until today, is that the uh, principles of compositionality are natural. You can expect those, something like very structured grammar. But the dislocation is a weird property that languages have, a kind of imperfection that we have to somehow, languages for some reason have this. Uh, formal languages would never be constructed with that property. And that uh, is still a, a widely held view. I think it's exactly the opposite of the truth. Uh, the, op the, the opposite, I think, turns out to be true, that uh, more recent work suggests that uh, dislocation is a kind of the null hypothesis. It's what's expected on the simplest grounds, and uh, uh, it's the uh, most primitive of operations. I'll come back to that. Uh, but let me just take a brief look at the steps that were taken to reach what I think is this conclusion. Well, in the 60s, uh, uh, phrase structure grammars were basically eliminated. A phrase structure grammar is far too rich to be uh, contemplated as relevant to describing languages. So there's nothing in phrase structure, the theory of phrase structure grammar that uh, prevents you, say, from having a, law, a rule, uh, you know, VP, arrow, uh, N, CP, let's say find phrase structure rule, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it was just assumed you just can't do that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, some, the right theory has to rule that out as uh, uh, unacceptable. And that step was taken by the late 60s, basically led to X-bar theory. Uh, X-bar theory had uh, interesting consequences, which weren't really fully appreciated at the time. They're, obvious in retrospect. Uh, for one thing, uh, X-bar theory, notice, has no linear order. So Japanese and English, say, roughly mirror images, have about the same X-bar theory. Uh, linear orders on the side somewhere. Uh, that was a step towards something which I think is now much clearer, uh, namely that the uh, surface order of expressions is not strictly speaking part of language. It's something else. Uh, I'll come back to that. But if you just look at X-bar theory, it's already a step in that direction. Uh, another thing about X-bar theory is it forces a theory of parameters. So Japanese and English say differ, and they're going to differ in some choice that is not determined by X-bar theory. So some they're the speaker and the hearer who's using a linear system of uh, externalization. You don't have to use that. But if you are using it, you're going to have to make a choice as to uh, the order in which you're going to uh, externalize the internal system. So X-bar theory itself first is a step towards separating a linear order and other surface organization from what we might think of as poor I language, uh, the I language that's dealing with the Galilean challenge, uh, constructing the set of linguistically articulated thoughts, putting externalization in some medium to the side. And I think that picture is becoming clearer. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, well, there are also, uh, along with the clear progress of X-bar theory, there were very serious problems which weren't recognized at the time. Uh, the main problem is uh, it excludes the possibility of exocentric constructions. Everything has to be endocentric in X-bar theory. And that's just false. There are exocentric constructions all over the place. 
uh, simple things like subject predicate, or for that matter, every case of dislocation without exception, except for head movement. All of these give you uh, exocentric constructions. There's no way to describe them in X-bar theory. Now, in order to describe them, many artifices were developed. So for example, if uh, you have a subject predicate construction, uh, maybe it was called a TP or an IP or something like that, or a VP. But that's just stipulation. You could just as well call it an NP, let's say. Uh, and this runs all the way through the uh, descriptive apparatus. So there was a serious problem not really recognized till the uh, couple of years ago. My own feeling is it's kind of over, it's pretty much overcome by labeling theory, which uh, tells you in a principled way in terms of minimal search, a simple computational principle, uh, when it is, uh, at when movement, uh, internal merge may take place, uh, when it must take place, uh, when it need not take place. And there are many interesting results. And, Plenty of interesting problems about this, a lot of very intriguing material, most of which I presume you're familiar with. Well, uh, by the moving up to the 1990s, it did seem to a number of us that it's enough had been learned, so it might be possible for the first time to confront the problem of genuine explanation. That's what's called the minimalist program. Uh, Pursuing that program, if you want the, if you want a genuine explanation, you want to start with computational operations, which meet the conditions of learnability and evolvability. Well, the easiest way to meet the condition of learnability is to say that learnability is zero. It's just innate. Uh, nothing to say about it. Uh, and the easiest way to meet the condition of evolvability would be to say, let's find a computational principle that had to evolve. There was no way for it not to have evolved. Well, if you look at those two conditions, they're satisfied by the most elementary uh, computational operation, what's been called merge in recent years, which incidentally has many problems that I'll come back to, but basically just the operation of a binary set formation. It, uh, it has to be there because the basic property exists. Okay? And that means at least, at the very least, the simplest operation must exist. Maybe more complex ones, but at least the simplest one. So we know that it has to exist, had to evolve. So it meets the condition of evolvability. Uh, that leaves the question of just how it happened and what the neurological implication is. but. Uh, Whatever the answers to those, this is an operation that had to evolve. And having evolved, it's innate, so it meets the condition of learnability. So if you can reduce something to that, you do have a genuine explanation. That's as far as it's possible to go. Okay? If, it doesn't, if you can't go that far, it's a description. It's not a, it's not a genuine explanation. Again, this is a pretty austere requirement, but I think it's the one we ought to have in mind uh, when we're thinking about the goals of our efforts in inquiring into language. Well, uh, so let's, I won't give the details because I think you're familiar with them, but uh, the simplest computational operation then uh, merge binary set formation, uh, meeting the, the uh, no, no tampering condition least possible computation. You don't modify the elements, don't add any more structure. Interesting things to say about this, uh, to which I'll come back. Uh, there is a good deal of current literature uh, which tries to show that you can reach this operation in steps. That's incoherent. You can't have partial binary set formation. You can't reach it in steps. Uh, it's either have it or you don't have it. There's nothing simpler. Again, lots of literature about this, but it's just beside the point. There's uh, actually a recent, uh, interesting recent paper by uh, Rini Hoybrooks uh, 
analyzing some of the recent proposals and showing why they don't make any sense. But if you think about it, they can't make sense. Uh, the simplest case of merge is going to have at least, maybe at most we would like to show, but at least two cases. One of them, external merge, when you're taking separate things and forming the set. One internal merge, when you're taking one thing and something inside it, forming the set of those. Those are at least the two, the two simplest possibilities. Notice there are only one operation. There's no, no two operations, just one operation with two cases. Uh, much confusion about this in the, uh, in the literature, but uh, that should be obvious if you think it through. Uh, well, uh, notice that uh, this, is, uh, this whole program is a program. It's not a theory. The program is to see how far can we go if we take the simplest possible operation and try to give genuine explanations in terms of it. Uh, maybe that's impossible. Maybe you have to find more complex operations. But in that case, it's going to be necessary to demonstrate how they can be acquired, how they can be learned, and how they could have evolved. And that's not so trivial. You can't just say, well, natural selection does anything I like. You know, that's not an explanation. Uh, you, can, you have to give a real explanation. Very difficult in uh, biology. It's, uh, in the biological literature, it's pointed out that, that it's uh, fiendishly difficult, standard phrase, to give an account of the evolution of almost any trait, even the simplest ones, like having blue eyes, for example. Uh, and it's, it's not the kind of thing you can hand wave about. So either you can try to meet that condition or recognize that you don't have genuine explanations. Well, uh, there have been, I think, uh, substantial achievements in the last recent years in trying to gain general, genuine explanations. They do have problems. I want to return to the problems later, but I'll put them on the shelf for a moment. Uh, the uh, uh, one, one achievement, which is not trivial, is to unify the two traditional kinds of operations compositionality and dislocation. Uh, they are unified once you keep to the simplest, the simplest computational operation. Uh, so uh, far from being an imperfection, as was always assumed by me in particular, uh, it would take a stipulation to bar dislocation. Uh, if you have no stipulations at all, you get dislocation. Uh, furthermore, as I mentioned before, that's uh, arguably the simplest case of merge. Uh, if you want, actually, you can't have only one and not the other, because once you have merge, you have both. But if you're looking for one that's more primitive, it's probably internal merge. Uh, the reasons for that are quite straightforward. Uh, external merge requires enormous search. Uh, to, to put two things together that are uh, uh, separate, First of all, you have to search the entire lexicon. Then you have to search everything that's already been constructed and maybe is sitting there somewhere waiting to be merged. With internal merge, you have almost no search at all. So one reason for uh, regarding internal merge dislocation as more primitive, it just doesn't, it requires a tiny fraction of the search. Uh, but there's a good deal more than that. Uh, there's some interesting suggestions in the literature. They're not definitive, but they're suggestive. So uh, one was uh, some work that was done by Marv Minsky a couple of decades ago. Uh, he and one of his students uh, just explored what would happen if you took the simplest Turing machines, smallest number of states, smallest number of symbols, and just let them run free and see what happens. What turned out was kind of interesting. Uh, most of them crashed, uh, either got into infinite loops or just stopped. You know. But the ones that didn't crash, uh, all of them gave the successor function. Uh, now, what's the successor function? 
Well, one thing the successor function is is internal merge. So if you take a merge and you have a one-member lexicon, just run three, get the successor function. That's Minsky's argument at the time was that probably uh, evolution, uh, in the course of evolution, nature found the simplest thing. That's what you'd expect. So it found the successor function. And that happens to be internal merge, not external merge. Uh, there's, uh, uh, if you look at other organisms, uh, way down to the level of insects, they, have, they count. So an ant, say, can count the number of steps it's taken. It's got a counter, maybe a set of counters inside. And if you look at just the mathematics of successive counters, they kind of tend towards the successor function. It doesn't take a big step to move them up to the successor function. So from various points of view, it uh, seems plausible to think that uh, of the core operations, the most primitive one is actually dislocation, uh, contrary to what was always thought. And uh, as you uh, get uh, richer constructions, you have external merge, and uh, it gives you richer kinds of languages. We plainly have it in natural language. It's not just internal merge. And interesting question is why. It probably has to do with argument structure, which is uh, uniquely related to external merge. I'll come back to that. Well, uh, what, uh, with the unification, of internal and external merge, uh, compositionality and dislocation. Uh, what was suggested by X-bar theory, as I mentioned before, becomes uh, much more clear and explicit. So uh, the, it seems that the uh, generation of the uh, CI interface, uh, sometimes called LF, uh, uh, what gets uh, semantically interpreted the, linguistically articulated thoughts, uh, that's uh, we can call core I language. And that just keeps the structure. No linear order, no other kinds of arrangements. So why is there linear order in spoken language? Incidentally, not, not strictly in sign language. So in sign language, which we know to be essentially equivalent to spoken language, there's different dimensionality. So you can use visual space. Or you can use uh, simultaneous operations, like facial gestures and motions. So it's not strictly linear. It makes use of the uh, contingencies allowed by the space that's of externalization. But speech happens to be linear. You have to string words one after another. Uh, so the, if you pick that particular modality of externalization, Yes, you're going to have linear order. But does linear order have anything to do with language? Well, you know, depends what you think you want to call language. But uh, what it really has to do with is an amalgam of two totally different independent systems. One of them, internal language. The other, a particularly sensory motor system, which has absolutely nothing to do with language. The sensory motor systems were around uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years before language ever appeared. And they don't seem to have been affected by language. At most, there's very minor suggestions about slight adaptations that might have taken place for, say, changes of the alveolar ridge in click languages. There's some very small things. But uh, basically, the sensory motor systems seem independent of language. But since you're, if you do externalize the internal system through this filter, you're going to get linear order. But strictly speaking, that's a property of an amalgam of two independent systems. And in fact, that's true of externalization altogether. And notice that uh, externalization poses a hard problem. You have two completely independent systems. They have nothing to do with one another. You have to match them somehow. Uh, you can expect that process to be pretty complex and also to be variable. You can do it in many different ways. Also to be easily mutable. 
and change from one generation to another under slight effects. Uh, putting all these expectations together, what, uh, what, what is a natural ex expectation, and uh, I think it increasingly is coming to be imaginable, maybe true, is that the variety and complexity and uh, mutability of language is basically a property of externalization, uh, not a property of language itself. And it could turn out to be true, it's a, it's a goal at the moment, that the core I language is really unique, may not vary from language to language. Actually, that much is pretty much tacitly assumed in uh, uh, essentially all the work on formal semantics and pragmatics. It's not assumed to be parameterized from one language to another or to be learned somehow. It's just there, you know, which means if we ever understand it properly, it'll be reducible to elementary computations which uh, just don't vary. That's the way the internal system works. That should be the goal of uh, inquiry in those directions. Uh, I should say just to, as a terminological point, what's called formal semantics is actually a form of syntax. It's a symbolic manipulation. Technically, something becomes semantics when you relate it to the external world. And that's a tricky business. Uh, even things like, say, event calculus, if you think about it, events are really mental, event, mental constructions. Uh, you can't find them in the outside world. You construct them there. And the task of relating what's internal to the external world uh, dealing with questions of reference is no trivial matter. A lot to say about this, but I'll put it aside. But it seems to me we can see a goal for all of this work to try to reduce it to computational operations that do meet the conditions of genuine explanation. Again, a very austere criterion, but I think one that's worth keeping in mind. Well, uh, these are all possibilities that I think are looking increasingly plausible. The field may go in that direction. It'd be very striking a discovery if it really does. Well, uh, let's go on with uh, genuine explanations. Uh, one of them is dislocation, uh, putting it together with compositionality. And notice that that includes automatically uh, the basis for what's called reconstruction. Uh, you keep to the no tampering condition, you automatically get what's called the copy theory of movement. That's the basis for the complex properties of reconstruction. There's a lot to look into, but that's essentially the basis for it. You don't need rules of reconstruction. They're just there. That's automatic. Well, of genuine explanations, the most interesting case, I think, is... Uh, the old principle of structure dependence. This was discovered back in the 1950s. This is really strange principle of language which had never been noticed, uh, namely that the rules and operations of language, uh, the ones that yield interpretation of sentences, don't pay any attention to linear order. They just deal with structures, which is extremely puzzling when you think about it. Because linear order is what you hear. It's 100% of what you hear. You never hear structure. Uh, furthermore, at least superficially, it seems that computations on linear order are simpler than computations on structure. Uh, from another point of view, that turns out to be false. But at least superficially, that looks right. So what it seems and what always seemed extremely puzzling is that... Uh, the rules that, the syntactic rules and the rules that yield semantic interpretations don't pay any attention to 100% of what you hear and to the simplest operations, which is a pretty puzzling fact. Uh, and uh, we now have a simple explanation for it. It follows from the simplest computational operation. Uh, if the entire internal language is based on the computation of the simplest merge operation in its simplest form, uh, then you automatically get uh, structure dependence for uh, uh, operations of 
movement of construal, of interpretation of everything else. I won't run through examples. I assume you're familiar with them, but uh, that just seems to be a fact about all constructions and all languages. Uh, it's 